Welcome to the Classical Gap Fest, a weekly discussion about the ever-changing world of classical music. I'm your host for this week, Kensho Watanabe, and with me as always are Tiffany Liu and William White. This week, we'll be discussing the English Touring Opera's decision to fire half of its orchestra citing diversity. Then, we'll have a movie club discussion of the French 1992 film Encore en Hébert. And finally, we'll discuss the lack of female conductors at America's top orchestras. But first, we like to start with our playlist segment. So, Tiffany, what do we have today? This week, we'll be playing a round of everyone's favorite game, Listening Limbo. In this game, I will name a category of works, say, for example, Beethoven symphonies, and our contestants will wager the amount of listening time they think it would take for them to identify a piece in that category. After the wagers are in, they'll each hear the clip for the amount of time they specified, and the contestant with the correct answer in the shorter amount of time wins the round. Are you guys ready to play? Always. Here we go again, Will. Okay. So for our first category this week, it's... Dvorak tone poems. Oh. Hmm, Dvorak tone poems. Oh. So these are mainly written at the end of his life, after his main body of symphonies and kind of symphonic dances and such. He started writing these pieces that are mainly based on Czech folk tales. They're like musicalized versions of those. Although there's, he branches out in some other stuff too. I mean, there's like Otello. I, I'm, I'm modestly familiar with this body of work, but I, you know, certainly not overly confident. How, how are you on these, Kencho? I'm not excited to hear that this is the first category. <laughs> well, as you know, we generally try and arrange the categories in order of... Decreasing difficulty, yes? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, can only it can only get easier from here. Oh no! <laughs> I love these tone poems a lot. I have I to really... say I do too, but I don't think I've done any of them actually mm. myself. And so then it's like I hear them, I'm like, oh, that's really fun. That's cool. I think I've played one mm-hmm. or two maybe, mm-hmm. but like if you ask me to name them, it's gonna be fun. All right. Well, um, I've flipped a coin, and Will, you're up first to wager. Yeah, okay. What's a good wager on this? Um, I'm going to go ahead and wager s- seven seconds. Well, I am going to adopt the Tiffany Lou strategy of if I'm not going to get it in the first three seconds, then I'm not going to get it at all. So I am going to underbid you and go for six seconds. Okay, that means, Kensho, I will ask you to mute yourself and take your earphones off. And here we go, Will. Here are your seven seconds of Dvorak. Hmm, I do recognize that little clip. Now, to put a name to it, I think it's either... I think it's either the Wood Dove or... The Noonday Witch. Um, a, a bit of a guess, I think, The Wood Dove. Oh, very good, Will. All right! <laughs> yes! I guess you must have gotten it right. He did get it right. I don't know if that means the pressure is on or the pressure is off. Oh, God. Okay. All right. Here are your six seconds of Dvorak Town Bond. <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, I don't recognize it based on the nothing that I just heard. So, um, okay. I think I know. Okay, Golden Spinning Wheel is one of them for sure. There's also the Noon Witch. And there's, I think, is there one that's like a water goblin? Or does that sound weird? Water goblin? I don't know that one. So I'm going to go off of either it's the Golden Spinning Wheel or it's the Noon Witch. I'm going to go with, uh, can we flip that same coin again, Tiffany, wherever you have that? <laughs> uh, I'll just say Golden Spinning Wheel and just leave it at that. Okay. Kensho, this is a, a, a tone poem called The Wood Dove. And I was sort of hoping that you, could, you guys would 
guess a little bit higher with this because what happens like in the next couple of seconds here is is the figure that represents the wood dove. This thing here. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, right. Well, um, that's uh, that's our first round. Let's go to our next round, which is Beethoven String Quartet's Opus 18. Oh. Oh, interesting. So there's six string quartets in the Beethoven Opus 18. These are his first string quartets. So it's string quartets one through six. Very well-known works, I would say. You know, if you were to play the first five seconds of any of them, I think I'd have a pretty good shot. Digging deeper into the inner and outer movements, um, I'm not quite so confident. And Kensho has the definite edge, which is that he will know what keys these are in. Do you know the keys? I know the keys of the quartets. Wow, but you know more than I do. <laughs> yeah, but if I, if I couldn't, you know, I won't be able to identify them just from the pitch. So, yeah, I'm not feeling great about it. How do you feel about it, Kensho? I mean, obviously better than the Dvorak tone poems, but again, there are always these little pockets of memory loss that I think I've ex <laughs> I just have. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay, well, you're up first for the wager. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, it's a healthy six seconds like I had last time because that clearly helped so much. I can go with six seconds here. Why not? In that case, I'm just going to... I'll, I'll wager five seconds. It's fine. Okay. Goodbye, Will. Bye. Oh boy, I hope I don't let my string players down here. We're going to get another angry email from Gabe for us missing this. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Gabe, in advance. Uh, we'll see. All right, here you go. What do you say again? Seven? Six. Six, okay. Welcome to Give Me Seven. Okay, it sounds like either an introduction or a slow movement. Um, we are in B, what seems like it's dom, yeah, it's dominant. So this, at least where we're going is E major or E minor, probably E major. Uh, when I think of sharp string quartets, 18, is it five or six? That's an A major. I think this is from the A major string quartet. Let's just say that. But I don't know which one that is. And I know that I know that quartet does not have an introduction. It's just bang straight in. So it's probably a slow movement. Let's say it's the second movement of either eighteen five or eighteen six. Um, I'm gonna say second movement eighteen six. It is the last movement of eighteen six. Ah, damn. So, so we'll see like how close we'll get. The there, last there is. A, yeah, well, this is La, that's La Malinconia, which I thought oh, might be, I mean, the, you know, dee -da -da -dum, that figure I thought might be recognizable nope. to you. It did not ding for me. Oh, well. And of course, the keys were no help to you in that case, because they move all over the place in that introduction. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, that it's in B flat major. To, uh, to at least got it. I got in the neighborhood. I'll yeah, you did. Well, we'll see how close Will gets. All right, so what am I up? Uh, what am I dealing with here? Uh, Kensho got close but no cigar. Okay. Although I guess there is there is kind of an incremental, you know, I mean, there it's possible for you to be closer and farther than he was. So we'll see. <laughs> That's true. Interesting. Here we go. Here are your five seconds. Well, I, I would go out on a limb and say this is a slow movement. I mean, we're in a major key at this point. There's only one of the six that's in a minor key, which I believe is number four in C minor. But of course, uh, you know, an interior movement can be in a, in a major key, even in a minor overall minor piece. And this was just like a random moment from <laughs> inside the movement. So the key is really not going to help me, or the modality is not going to help me too much here. Are you able to eliminate? Really? No, I'm not able to eliminate much. I'm really not. So I, I'll just say the second quartet, second movement. 
Okay, well, I will apologize because I did not think that this one was going to bamboozle you as much as it did. I tried to pick a snippet of a motive that I thought would be a dead giveaway. Mm. This is the the beginning of the last movement of the last quartet. Oh. The fourth movement, which, of course, is La Malinconia. <gasps> so all award can show half a point for getting in the right quartet. He did guess quartet number six, but he asked. Uh, he also thought it was the slow movement, so he guessed movement two. Mm, I see. All right, well, uh, let's come up up upon our final category of the day here, which is, and I'm going to pull from an oldie but goodie, Tchaikovsky symphonies. Mm. These are tricky, right? Because obviously four, five, and six, we should be able to get within, I don't know, two seconds, perhaps? Mm -hmm. But then there's, you know, I know one and two pretty well. Three is the one that's like a complete, like, mystery. The Polish the Polish one. And let us not forget the Manfred. Manfred counts, right? The secret symphony between numbers four and five. Right. All right, so the bid is mine, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotta, gotta put the pressure on here. The question is, is, it's a question of two or three. Ooh. And I'm gonna bid three seconds. Ooh, okay, that puts actually more pressure. Because I was thinking if you said two, I would I know if I had said two, exactly, exactly. You would have made me eat it. But now I'm going to lay it on you. Mm -hmm. Glad to see my strategy is working, at least resting some pain from you. All right, let's do this. <laughs> Two seconds. Let's Two do seconds. It. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Okay, here we go. And. Yeah, this is uh, the second symphony fourth movement the little russian aka the ukrainian very good well all right, all right. Oh, okay all right so okay well well got it which means that with two seconds you can take this okay. home with you okay, okay, so okay. here we go one is Winter Dreams, two is Little Russian, so this is number two. Do you have a movement? Uh, last movement. Last movement of number two it is. Nice. All right. Oof. Very good. So Kensha oh, takes that redeemed. round and wins the day, I think, with one and a half points to Will's one. <laughs> <laughs> That just about does it for this week's Prelude segment. But before we wrap up, we'd like to remind our listeners that we do periodic listener-generated Name That Tune rounds. So we invite you to try and stump us. Check our show notes where you'll find a link to the form where you can upload a 30-second clip of an unidentified piece of classical music for us to try to identify. And with that, we will move on to our first topic. Will, what do you have for us? Our first story this week comes out of Great Britain, where on September 10th, the UK Musicians Union released the following statement, quote, The union is appalled to hear that a number of members have been sent a letter by English Touring Opera, stating that they will not be booked for the 2022 tour. This equates to almost half the orchestra losing their roles. Many of these members have been performing with the ETO for 20 years or more. And even those who have been with ETO for fewer years have been loyal to the company season after season. The ETO has stated that it is prioritizing, quote, increased diversity in the orchestra. This is in line with the firm guidance of the Arts Council, principal funder of ETO's touring work, end of quote. It's worth being specific about the language here. The Musicians Union notes that these players will not be booked for the 2022 tour, which is to say that these musicians have not been fired. They are contracted on a yearly basis and there is no tenure system, so technically it is within the rights of the ETO to pick and choose their players fresh every season. And in fact, the ETO states that this is exactly what it did. They held auditions for the 2022 tour and chose several new players based on skill. So what are we to believe? The statement from the letters that went to the musicians stating that their hiring decisions were guided by a desire for increased diversity in the orchestra, or the statement on the ETO's website that leaves diversity out of the equation altogether and sticks to excellence as its only standard. What do you guys make of this? Uh, I, I have a question, I guess, which is that they, the orchestra says that it held auditions for the 2022 
tour and chose several new players based on skill, I presume that doesn't mean that they auditioned everybody who, quote, was already, like, in or has played with the orchestra before, right? That was my question, too. Yeah, I don't think that they re-auditioned the previous members. Yeah, and if so, how can you, like, necessarily claim, oh, yeah, we just hired half of our orchestra based on skill, and is this not just a matter of, like, a very bad PR disaster example of trying to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, that was a question that I had. Another question that I had was just like, do I believe the ETO that they were seeking diversity or, you know, I mean, we all know how it is with orchestras. Like there are people who have maybe been around a little too long. They're getting rusty. You know, they're not quite what they used to be. So was this just an excuse to get rid of players that they didn't like having in the orchestra? But see, that's ridiculous because the, the two places at which that dynamic tends to happen are one, professional orchestras with a tenure ch- system mm-hmm. and two, community orchestras. Mm-hmm. And this is neither of those things. Like they right. would not have had to run aground of any such legal challenges or or and so there was no need for them to resort to such a like even this like this idea that sometimes community orchestras do of re-auditioning all of their members in 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 an effort to raise its standard like they didn't have to do that my question is about the arts council Mm -hmm. so there they i guess give the most amount of money to the eto and what was said like we don't know what 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 the guidance was it says firm guidance from the arts council but what was the what was the requirement they just said what change your the composition of your ensemble so that no, it's they more didn't. diverse no no and in fact the the arts council has been yeah. very clear about this in saying that they did not instruct ETO to fire half of the orchestra but that's like a hell, that's a heck of a statement to put out there naming the arts council if you know that they didn't do that that's like that's easily dispelled no, by eh, a tweet eh, 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 i don't know i think it's more complicated than that because yeah. because obviously so so arts council i believe is essentially the equivalent of our NEA. Okay. And obviously we've talked about how in, you know, European countries, like there's much more money on the line here. I mean, you know, they, they are much um, more robustly serving and funding the arts organizations. So, you know, you'd want to take what they say pretty clearly. And, you know, even here, I mean, in Seattle, like our city government uh, office of arts and culture, you know, there everything is about increased diversity like you know that's that's how you get any money from them is you have to point to the fact that your organization is doing anti-racist work specifically and that that, that's clearly the imperative coming from so many arts funding organizations around the world is to do this my question is just like is 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 the ETO using this as an excuse? And if they are, is that in any way serving the cause of social justice? And I have a feeling the answer is no. Well, the, the proof will be in the pudding, right? Because what we know is that half the orchestra has had no contracts renewed, but we're not quite sure what the eventual makeup of the orchestra is going to actually be. If we were to look at it from an extremely result-oriented perspective, let's say that of the half of the orchestra whose seats are open now, if... All of those. Let's let's go. Hand, let's go big. Let's, if all of those are replaced by people of color, will that have been a success? And is the success dependent on the messaging that comes out? And so is this messaging, you know, going to spoil the that entire effect? I don't know. I, I'm also a little bit interested in sort of the media criticism angle of this and just like the everybody criticism angle of this, because, yeah. you know, obviously, like it's fully you can be so hyperbolic about it. Yeah. Right? Like. It's like it's very it's great fodder right. for conservative panic monger, fear mongering of like they're all look at what's happening. They're all coming to get us. And then here, here comes the breakdown of society. Right. And we're talking about 12 musicians in a pit orchestra, yeah. you know, and, yep. and to that effect, too, it's like, OK, it's within the musicians union right to like come out swinging, you know. But I also wonder, like, how smart it is for them to even do this, because like there's nobody's contract was breached here. Shouldn't they be like picking their battles a little bit better? I don't know. It just it seems a little strange. That's true. But like, I mean, maybe the freelance scene is a little different in the in Great Britain. But you know how some of these freelance gigs go. I mean, it's yeah. almost like you have tenure in terms mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. if you find a good gig and you're not, you're a good colleague and you have some kind of social like right. awareness. You're you can basically bank on you know, the nutcrackers, you know, or whatever, 
that as like you know you're it's like a, a month of work that you just like are counting on right so it's it, it there is a sense of like entitlement to that position even though yes like the contract wasn't breached like that's like oh yeah that's my gig i don't know maybe it's different in the in great britain i'm not sure. no i think it, i don't think it is i think it might be impression. even more that way frankly <laughs> yeah. however you paint it it feels like kind of a pr disaster for the orchestra and it's like wasn't there a whatever your motives wasn't there a smarter way to have done this pr <laughs> you know if you wanted there to be a diversity thing isn't there like like a more gradual the same way that you phase out people in your orchestra that you might not want anymore who have tenure you wait until they have an opening until you have an opening to phase them out right yeah, like, it's true but of course i mean there's a big but there's a big tension there with with the calls for pretty radical change in our society to to even the playing field that we're on. You know, I mean, why like, is that? A, no, it's not a tension. I mean, like, I, I would say that based on the council's statement now, they're saying, no, we actually didn't ask for them to do this. Mm -hmm. And what they what I'm guessing happened is that they have what you say, well, with like these really strong statements of we are strong advocates of equal representation in society, et cetera, et cetera. And we recommend that X, Y, and Z happen, you know, that, that all organizations sh should also allocate funds to further these aims, right? And ETO took that and either as if, if we want to be cynical about it, either took it as a chance to like not even phase out, but just like eliminate half of its orchestra, maybe for reasons not related to diversity at all, or to say we can get athletes of money from the council by doing this all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And now they don't really get either. I can't imagine that getting rid of half of your playing group as your freelance playing group is going to cultivate a lot of goodwill among the freelancing community. <laughs> it's super interesting to me because we've seen, we've covered a number of these stories where an organization or institution tries to, I don't even want to say do do good because not really what the intention is anyway, but an organization that does a very kind of knee-jerky, not longitudinal view or a change that they want to make with regard to diversity or equity, and it kind of blowing up in their face because they haven't really thought out how they're going to do it or just, again, like Will says all the time, like it's in all the details, right? And it's interesting because we talk also about how there is change that's long overdue. Like that's the messaging, right? That we we are so behind the times that we need to change and we need to change quickly. And so I find that misguided ensembles or institutions get kind of caught in the middle of that, of not being able to change mm -hmm. fast enough to kind of go with the times, but also do it so fast that it just becomes a reactionary, knee-jerky, not well thought out, dare I say tokenist kind of approach to the change that they need to be making. And I think that what is the solution for that? I mean, it obviously needs to be strong leadership that kind of can kind of guide that and convince people that we're going to make this change over X amount of years instead of just next week, we're going to change out <laughs> half the orchestra. But uh, what again, like it, how do we how do we ma manage that kind of um, tug of war that's happening? Well, let me tease out one thread that I think is contributing a lot, which is that l let's let's take the ETO at their word and, and say that, yes, they were trying to further the aims of diversity mission statements uh, given forth by the council. The way that funding bodies evaluate eligibility for funding is always going to be result oriented. It's always going to be tied to specific numbers and metrics and audience, you know, and, and, and proportions and pie charts and these kinds of things. And yet the ability of those things to actually represent reality in the way that we need them to, if we're going to allocate funding thoughtfully and to places that matter when to people who are doing good work is so little that kind of data, you know, and unfortunately, it, it's what we have, especially when you reach a certain volume of applications, like you need to be able to compare them. And you need to be able to compare them quantitatively and not just say, there's good work being done here. But the, th the same thought occurs to me all the time, uh, looking at the job interview process, where you want a candidate who has all the pieces, but all they can do is put down their GPA and their, you know, number of held positions and all that and, and put it into your big basket of, of all these other people with the same qualifications and hope that it spits out the right one for you, comparing across these metrics that are only loosely represent reality. And so the language, whatever guiding language, if there's a lesson in here for the council, the guiding language for these kinds of aims needs to be a lot better. Well said. And of course, this is a topic that we 
you know, it has many themes that we come back to a lot. So as always, we would love to hear from our listeners about what, what you all make of this story. And uh, with that, I think it's time to go on to our second topic. Kensho. For our second topic today, we are going to review the 1992 French film by Claude Sauté, En Coeur en Hiver, starring Emmanuel Béart, Daniel Autoy, and André Dussaurier. The film is available on YouTube, and as always, we've linked it in the show notes. The story revolves around Stéphane, a luthier, and his business partner Maxime, who begins to have an affair with a young violinist Camille, played by Béart. What makes this film so fun to review for us at the GabFest is the extensive use of Ravel's chamber music throughout the film, along with many scenes of musicians rehearsing, performing, and recording. Let's hear a clip. Oui, c'est différent. Mieux, non? Plus clair, oui. Oui. Hmm. La dernière fois, ça ne vous avait pas frappé? Si, mais. Ça met un certain temps. Ça n'avait pas l'air d'être le moment de vous en parler. Tant y repensant. Bon, on reprend? All right, so there's a lot to unpack here, guys, but what this is first, you know, what did you think of the film? Did you like it? I enjoyed it, I think. I mean, as, as a, a self-described film phil- philistine, <laughs> I thought the film was, you know, subtle and, and kind of interesting. It explores a corner of, of the love triangle that we don't often see, which is like, you know, something other than the tired trope of person gets jealous of other person <laughs> and, uh, and, and ensuing chaos. So this kind of explores an interesting version of that would say. So in general, I thought it was it was quite a nice film. William? Uh, I'm going to be somewhat useless in discussing this because I was so, I guess, distracted <laughs> early on in this film by the, um, the milieu, specifically like the costume. I don't know. So it was like, it's 1990, what, two in Paris? And apparently in 1992 in Paris, Every man wore a suit all the time. Oh my God, here we go. And this is what distracted you for the duration of the This is what movie. distracted me, yes. Is it, this was like, this, this movie took place in a parallel universe in which the t-shirt had never been invented. And because that's someplace that I would so love to live, I just, I was very distracted. I was just waiting for like somebody to have a pair of jeans. And finally in the, like the last scene, um, Emmanuel Bayard did have a pair of jeans. But um, also just that like, you know, they went to these bistros for lunch every day and everybody is smoking. Every single person in the restaurant is smoking. And the the waiters still in 1992 are wearing white jackets and coming around and everything is served on these very nice trays and stuff. So like, I... <laughs> When it comes to like the plot or even the music in here, I I just was overwhelmed. Even when they were at that country house, the little kids were wearing like perfectly tailored like 19th century yeah, like white um, clothes <laughs> yeah. and never stained. I don't know. So so I'm I'm so sorry. I mean like yeah, I can tell you the 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 beats of the plot, but um I was very uh I was very distracted. What did you think, Kencho? Well, just to your point, like it kind of goes along with like what people imagine Paris to be like even now, I feel like. Yes. Which is, I mean, and I can attest to this now. It's certainly not like that anymore in 2021. But it's what people imagine, you know, the restaurants and the people smoking and how people are dressed and all this stuff. People just kind of dream up these little images, vignettes of Paris, right? Exactly. And this movie came out in 1992. I was nine years old. About four years later, I had become a total Francophile and French movie buff and fallen in love with the French language. And my mother would take me to like the blockbuster and we would go to the foreign section. And, And I watched a lot of movies that looked very much like this. I don't think I ever saw this movie particularly, but, you know, it definitely informed my opinion about what France was like. So just just being transported back into that world and like that 
era of my um, adolescent formation about like my worldview. Th I think that that's what got me so off track here. But anyway, I'm so sorry to derail the conversation before it even started. What, what did you think of it, Kencho? I, I, I'm always here for this kind of movie where it really everything happens, but nothing happens. You yeah, know, like yeah. this is very much <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the line of like lost in translation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like Vicky Cristina Barcelona. Have you seen that movie yeah, as well? Yeah, I have seen that. Mm -hmm. With the, the, the love triangle and stuff. Like those are the movies uh, or like nothing really yeah, significant ever. Yeah, but that movie has so that, much there's a lot, more Well, it's fire, obviously been, you know, when Penelope Yeah, there's a lot Cruz more going in. on in that movie. Yeah. I, I, have, I mean, I can talk about that movie forever. I love that movie so much. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, but like Lost in Translation where like, you know, it's just kind of, it's all about the vibe. Things, yeah, it's, it's like about the, the plot. Vibe, it's, and I'm, and, and I'm, I, I'm with you, Kensho. I think that plot is like the most overrated thing in a movie. Just give me vibe, give me characters, and give me music, and that's what I want to see. Totally, you know? totally. And milieu. It's, and well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the definition of milieu. <laughs> exactly. So now that we got that out of the way, right, mm -hmm. there are obviously some other um, distractions, let's say, that <laughs> maybe only people that are well versed in classical music or love classical music may. Uh, notice in the film so mm -hmm. first of all I'll start off in on a positive note because obviously Emmanuel Bea who plays the violinist in this movie obviously took some kind of violin lessons or had some coachings even as to like what kind of fingerings to use to for mimic a year a apparently. certain mm -hmm. okay so she took a year of lessons so while I appreciate the effort it actually almost became even more infuriating when it was just so horribly not synced or it was i mean her bow arm was just that was the thing that just kind of killed me when i was watching it um so let's just talk about like just the is there such thing I, I, that was my question was like is there ever such thing as like good faking in terms of playing an instrument in these films or a, a tv series what do you guys think about that i have a feeling that the failure to sync properly was not actually her fault Fair. It, I, yeah. I mean, I actually, because all of the sequences, even the ones in which, and let's, we haven't even talked about, like, what happens. So there's a there's a love triangle, there's two men, there's a, the luthier who is sort of a little bit more cold, you know, a little bit kind of foreign to the language of love, and then there's his kind of biz, more businessman partner who is better at kind of sussing out musicians and their likes and dislikes and doing the business end of things. And then... Um, and Camille is this superstar violinist who comes to, you know, uh, who is the girlfriend of Maxime, uh, the, the front man, and then becomes interested in Stefan, uh, ultimately. And so there are scenes in which other musicians who are obviously trained, right? There's, there's a cellist and the pianist who are actually, you know, they know how their instrument operates. And I assume that they, it was okay to bring in musicians or like trained folks because I, I mean it looked to me like they were trained musicians right it, do you guys agree i, I rewatched a little bit of it this morning and the cellist i think looks like he's playing the pianist i wasn't so sure about i don't know Some there, of his... there was one scene in like the recording where the elbows were yeah, just and like he's like flapping out out all over the back. place yeah and i was <laughs> like and then and then i read because he's he actually is a pianist so like oh, i wonder if that's like should we not hate on this because maybe that's just how he plays no, I also think that that may very well have Peace. been the result of direction. They're saying, can you, can you, can you emote a little bit more? It just doesn't mm. look like enough. Can you do mm. something? And like maybe that day he got pissed and he was like, fine, totally. I'll show you something. And then he like ends up with this ridiculous laughing yeah, thing. Like chicken dance. But, you yeah. know, it, it kind of does go to show like how the, we think that it's really easy to go out and just like get a musician and for them to like show up on stage and, or not on stage, on screen. And for that to be so much better than with the product that we ended up with. But it's probably not this simple. Even in the scenes with that they were, you know, showing the cellist and the pianist playing their bits, that was also pretty grossly out of sync. All of that was really out of sync. It's not, I don't think it's Camille at all, or whatever the actress's and name they is. They are, yeah. Right, and so it, she's doing, in a lot of the shots, to her very great credit, the right finger. I'm yeah. actually pretty amazed. I thought it was <laughs> yeah. good faking. I to answer your question, Kensho, yeah, I think that there is better and worse faking. I mean, like we I think we've talked about like, you know, those um stock image photos where like the violinist is actually holding the, the instrument one that with the wrong hand. of the oboist with yeah. the, all the rings and the yeah. oboist oh God, with the rings the and like, you know. And so yeah, I think that Emmanuel Bach did a, a 
pretty creditable job of, of representing. Mm. And this was not the only uh, violin performance that we saw. At the very beginning of the movie, we see uh, this man who's also like a, ah, yes. supposed to be like a very well-respected soloist or something. He's got a big, you know, solo concert or whatever mm -hmm. and something wrong with his violin. And, you know, uh, Stefan's like, oh, play something. And he mm -hmm. plays like the slowest presto <laughs> from the, the Bach solo sonata in G minor. <laughs> and then it kind of like edits right into like it kind of like, you know, what is it? Um, um, fades into the performance as well using the mm -hmm. same audio. And I'm like, oh, wow, like that. That was how he played in the concert, too. OK, <laughs> cool. Like, good for you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I guess that was a precursor to what we were about to see for the rest of it. <laughs> I have another observation and then a question. I thought the depiction of the luthiery in the movie was extremely good. Me too. I mean, I have spent mm -hmm. quite a lot of time in luthier shops as a, a person who, I mean, I, one of my best friends is a luthier, so I spent hmm. hours and hours and hours in his shop doing these little tasks for him, you know, gro you know shaving down pegs, adjusting bridges, all of the hmm. way he uses the knife to carve the bridge, like all of that is accurate. All of it is. Hmm. Um, and to a certain extent, well, you know, the, the language that they wrote surrounding his adjustments to her violin is a little Mm -hmm. Like it has the same, um, it has the same issues that are that w of what we were talking about surrounding the performance, but the actual physical depiction of the luthery is really, really good. And so my question for you is, you know, when you can depict something like luthery or let's say even like guitar playing so much more easily than you can depict an on-screen violinist. I mean, if you you know you have an actress who spent a year trying to even look like a passable professional violinist and it's still kind of like slightly cringy. Is it still worth doing? To me, it is worth doing because I like to see, you know, classical music represented on screen. It's this very particular world. There's a lot of interesting stories that can be told within it. And of course, the musical element just amplifies the storytelling so much. I mean, if, if, if this had been about these characters and the Ravel had been like taken out of it, I think I would have been totally taken out of it. You know, I think I think it would have been really boring, quite honestly, suits aside. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think it is worth it. And because because like so few people are, are, you know, like us in terms of being string players who can suss that out. Like because I, I, I looked up a bunch of um, IMDb reviews and people would be like, oh, my God. I mean, I, I never would have guessed that she wasn't playing the violin. And, you know, these are people who are film buffs. Like, they watch a lot of stuff. But I think the, the trade-off was the, the year that was invested in getting her up to speed. And actually, I think when I think about it, yes, obviously, there were a few things that annoyed me about the about the <laughs> dubbing or whatever. But, I mean, I appreciate the effort. And I think mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. to answer Tiffany's question, I think it really depends on the level of expertise. Like, even if there was a, a movie about baseball, I think a professional baseball player would find things that are extremely ag aggravating about it that, you know, a normal, even, mm -hmm. you know, having played baseball when I was younger and, you know, watch it constantly, I probably will just let go just because it's like, oh, well, whatever, it's a baseball movie. Right. Right. But right. I, so I think that the level of expertise obviously will lend itself to finding little things that annoy us about whether it's real or not. But I do appreciate the effort, right, that it was taken to at least try to sync up even the right bow strokes. You know, mm -hmm. if there was a lot, there was a lot of like string crossings and mm -hmm. stuff that they were really trying to replicate with the sound. So, I mean, I applaud the the effort. Um, the, the, big, the, the bigger question that I wanted to ask, because this is what I was thinking about, this kind of surrounds the, the um, character of Stefan, was just kind of this depiction of the artist or like this kind of person that's... Um, a genius in their field and whatever and obviously he had like shut himself off from the world like he didn't want love and whatever like obviously it was a theme of many in this movie like do you guys truly believe that solitude is essential for good artistic work um you know for me personally it is and I, that's why i wish that i hadn't been able to like pay better attention in this movie because i mean i essentially am stefan you know i mean like <laughs> i mean literally just to do like to, to compose a piece of music like like unless you're some collaborative artist doing stuff with other people, like composing is a solitary thing, even p p conducting, practicing, you know, you need a lot of solitary time 
to do your homework in order to to then go on and, and perform publicly. Whether that means that you can't like have any friends, but you know, Stefan had friends. He had that that that, that woman he had that he one was, friend. Yeah, that he was going out to dinner with all the time. I, I never quite understood what was going on there, but there there is a fair amount of that that I think is legitimate. One of the things that I appreciated the most about this movie, and and maybe this is just means I need to watch fewer American movies, was like I wasn't really tempted to stereotype Stefan that mm-hmm. way. I, you know, even though, yes, there is this sense of and, you know, if this has been if this had been an American movie, like he would have been the complete savant. Mm. He would have had like the worst, you know, social manners and been completely cold and, you know, like overtly. And there was none of that kind right. of overacting or overwriting mm-hmm. of that role, even though we are, you know, kind of led to believe that Stefan is this kind of what I think actually comfortably fits into the category of a row or a romantic mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like, which is now an actual we recognize that as a an actual category of personality like this is a real thing and not just a movie stereotype so that is one of the things i that i quite appreciated about this movie and frankly the same about maxime and camille to lesser degrees i mean they fit they fit more well the the usual kind of male female you know artist temperaments that that we are kind of taught to expect from hollywood but even camille in her most kind of unstable moments in the movie you still felt like that there was some subtlety there and something that cannot be completely explained by just saying oh she's a violinist who uh, kind of is a little bit weird in her everyday encounters but is her all of all of her passion comes out in her playing like she's not just that either <laughs> mm-hmm. right. so i i did appreciate that in general about the characterizations of the three people yeah definitely a much more nuanced approach here which i really appreciate i'll wrap this up by just uh, just sharing the news i don't know if you guys saw that there's a <laughs> m- new movie coming out uh i don't know if it's about chelabidake but it must be yeah it's a bio and mm-hmm. they they got john malkovich to play chelabidake what did you guys think of this <laughs> so this was actually very funnily uh totally apropos of a text thread that i was having with listener eric one of our um most devoted listeners of this show when we were talking about Jaap van Sweden. And he said that he thought that Jaap van Sweden looked like John Malkovich. And then like five hours later, it turns out that John Malkovich is going to play <laughs> Sergio Celibidache. So um, uh, I I'll, I'll, can't wait to see that. That'll be a great movie club entry for our podcast. Yeah, and then we still have uh, the... Leonard Bernstein's uh, biopics coming out, right? right? And we and 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 also Ron Howard is supposedly slated to direct a long, long biopic. So I think we're going to have quite a smorgasbord coming up. Wow, lots to do on the movie club here at the Gabfest. Yeah. All right, on to our third topic. Tiffany, what do you have for us? Last week, New York Times reported a quote group of women could be on the cusp of breaking barriers in one of music's most stubbornly homogenous spheres, the male-dominated world of orchestral conducting. End quote. While Marin Alsop's groundbreaking career as music director of the Baltimore Symphony seemed to indicate change was on the horizon well over a decade ago, roadblocks for women on the podium seemed to be stubbornly in place. Old stereotypes about the maestro's look and feel, the, quote, lag time in the process of allowing young conductors to build real relationships with orchestras, and lack of diversity in boards and hiring committees. But here's some hopeful supporting evidence for the claim that we may be at the beginning of a sea change. There is a wave of conductors in their 60s and 70s in America who are confirmed or expected to step down from their positions at the helms of major American orchestras over the next several seasons, and a corresponding wave of young and female conductors in their 30s who are, quote, creating buzz. Add that to the demand and interest in changing our landscape, and we may have arrived at a tipping point. Here to talk with us is one of the many dynamic conductors mentioned specifically by name in the Times article, Lino Gonzalez Granados, conducting fellow of the Philadelphia Orchestra and recently appointed resident conductor of Los Angeles Opera, is an internationally recognized artist. Most recently, she was the recipient of the 2021 Sphinx Medal of Excellence, the third prize of La Maestra competition, and the 2020 Schulte Foundation U.S. Career Assistant Award. Her current concert season will include debuts with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Oxford Philharmonic, Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, the San Antonio Symphony, the Rhode Island Philharmonic, and others. And of course, I won't miss a chance to say that I've been an admirer of Lena's work for such a long time. Welcome to the podcast, Lena. Thank you, Tiffany, my friend, and Kensho, and Will, to invite me to your amazing space. I am very honored. 
Well, let's uh, let's just get the conversation going here. So I, I assume that you've seen seen the article. What do you think of the landscape as it stands right now? I mean, it seems to be uh, kind of burgeoning with opportunity the way the New York Times puts it here. Well, I don't mean to be a party pooper from the beginning, but <laughs> I mean, as much as I'm very honored and surprised eh, by the mention, I I think there's a much bigger change that needs to happen before we can see real advancement eh, that we keep talking and promising. Yeah. What comes to mind first for you? One of the quotes that I felt very, that it was very interesting uh, was from this guy at Cincinnati to say that uh, women conductors have been there, talent has been there. We just mm-hmm. like, uh, it's impossible to to assume that they, like we just appear yeah. out of nowhere. <laughs> you know? It's like the, the short sightedness of biases uh, that have to just to be amplified a little and the lens have to include more women of color. We need to think about women that are also mothers. We need to think about women of also different ages, not only young yep. women that are rising bus, because there's also a huge space of, and I'm not saying like in the in between middle age and uh, up and coming that have just a like a stay in a loop because they have to choose between having a career or actually having a life. Right. That is not fair at all. And it's because it's because the boards and the systems are not made for women to thrive. You know, it's like for women to just get there and also people of different races to assimilate. But the system right. but but it's it's way too patriar- patriarchal. Did I say mm-hmm. that word? Is that a word? Yeah. It's, it's too male dominated for a, a real change to happen, you know? Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's just like we are all unicorns trying to do our own thing. <laughs> Well, speaking of dreaming bigger, I mean, one of the staggering things now that we see from this the very beginning of this article is the fact that among the 25 largest ensembles in the U.S., um, there are no women serving as music directors. And, you know, Lena and I, we, we talked offline a little bit about the way we see the role of a music director, at least on our side of things, you know, like how we want to inhabit that role as a music director. But now we're, we're seeing, you know, New York Philharmonic is going to have an, uh, an opening these very, very prominent orchestras are going to have openings in the coming years. Have you any thoughts about the process through which orchestras should be doing this so that they find not only the right person, but also to really go through the process with an open mind like we we, we hope for? That That is difficult because then we mean that we really need to take a hard look at ourselves and say, okay, why don't we hire a consultant to do bias training and to see how can we how can we just like start doing that the 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 job starts a little bit earlier and the big orchestras do they have the time to do that i mean they have the resources but do they have the time so i don't know like i'm i'm waiting eagerly after i i want to see if this pressure will translate into something because it hasn't happened in the last year and i thought the last year, if something was going to allow us at least to have one music director, you know, like one, like, let's, let's have one, let's have two, you know, they're great, great, like American conductors. It has to, it has to feel like a complete change. It cannot be only as making the change as female conductors is like right. or or the person of color being the change the agent of change trying right. to save your the entire you know musical business because no it's it's everyone's job to get ahead you know or to jump at least at the times that we're leaving so we're obviously talking about the landscape of orchestral music directors and orchestras in the United States and that's because of this uh, prompting of this article from the New York Times talking about it and the fact that Marin Alsop is stepping down from the Baltimore Symphony. And so now there's no um, female music directors at the helm. And I'm just wondering, this is for anybody uh, in the group today. Do you think that this situation is better in Europe or Latin America or Australia or any other place? Like, 
you know, I mean, just just to broaden our sense of the world here, because my sense is that in some ways Europe is better, but in some ways it's also more retrograde. I don't know. It's sort of like it's on both ends. Uh, maybe Kencho, I don't know. You're living over there now. Do you have any? Yes, uh, the whole uh, the whole month that I've been here. Uh, yeah. Yes, I have a very great insight into all of this. I don't know. I don't. I don't feel like it's better here. I mean, it certainly don't. But see... there are female music directors in Europe. They exist, yes. Yeah. But is it again? Like, is that is that um, have we reached the goal? Like, <laughs> are we done there? Like, mm-hmm. is the work finished? Obviously not, right? So, and I don't know. I mean. It's encouraging to see competitions like La Maestra, you know, Lena, you know, participated last year where, I mean, and to do it in a way where it's like we're going to showcase female talent on the podium is fantastic. Um, I think that that attitude, I don't I don't know if that would be something that the U.S. would ever see. But you bring up an interesting point, which is, I mean, let's hypothetically put you know, Lena, when, frankly, when, not if, you become a music director of a, of a symphony, I, I, I will kind of put that in your future that I, that I see for you. The sense certainly won't be, you know, we've arrived, like we're here, you know, what, what is the feeling that we must take into the, the future for, for you or for, you know, for all, any woman who become help of, at the helm of a major, let's say, American orchestra, you know? I think, What needs to happen is women and leaders around the world, uh, women and both men that are in positions of power, really transforming small, small parts, you know, like their city, Mm -hmm. their town, then become like a little bit ample and their state, their country, a little by little doing it. I think this conception of like Messiah that or what Marin has done that she's larger than life and amazing, like uh, representing this whole, defending us all and open doors for Mm -hmm. everyone. And now it's our job to just go and do it in our own communities to to create like change that is like a little bit local. And I think it will expand. I don't know what you guys think. What do you think, Will? Yeah, I don't know. I think I think sometimes about how like I've learned a lot about um, board recruitment and board membership and service. And one thing they talk about a lot is if you want to change the culture of a board, like let's say you've got some some very stodgy people who are stuck in their ways and they're sort of bullies on a board and that they're defining the character of the board. You can't just bring in one person and expect that that person is going to be, like you say, the messiah and is going to change the culture. You need to bring in like three people who are not going to deal. You know, they're not going to put up with like this bully culture or this conservative culture. You know, it, it, and of course, it, you know, it depends on the number of people that you have on the board. Right. So if you have like 15 people and they're all set in their ways, then you need to bring in like 10 30. people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need you need to bring in a, a critical mass. And that's what I think think we need right to see right now you know I mean it's like Ruth Bader Ginsburg who was always asked you know when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court and she said when there are nine nine. you know (laughs) you know and so like I don't know maybe this is is an exciting moment I mean we're sort of we're we're like um Schrodinger's cat right now you know because there's all of these openings for um for music directors in the united states i mean i don't know according to the new york times in this article it was like five or six and that was even before um yap van Sveden announced that he was going to step down from the from the new york philharmonic so i don't know if we have like seven openings for music directors in the united states i'd love to see five to seven of them be filled by female conductors then we'd really be able to say like, okay, we're making real progress here. And then it's like, we're, you know, maybe we're at a critical mass. We're sort of over the hump. Um, so that, you know, going forward then, the the question, I mean, it's going to be a while before the question of gender is just removed from the equation. But like, that's obviously where we want to be. And... I don't know. It's 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 like you say. I think I think that we need a, a bit of a sea change before that can happen. And so maybe maybe this is an exciting time. Maybe maybe we will we'll see a move in that direction. 
Because certainly I think that orchestra administrators are quite conscious of this right now. Well, you know, Will, it's interesting that you were talking about boards because one thing that always occurs to me, and, and the New York Times article does spend quite a bit of time going into, oh, diversity in boards and hiring committees and how important that is to, to evening the landscape, we'll say. But one thing that is always a little murky to me is you can't just bring in somebody into a board, even if it's, you know, even if it's half of the board. Having a board generally means people who have been embedded in the culture or are rich <laughs> and supportive. And those two things, I mean, we can be as cynical as we want about the money thing, but the, the truth is, okay, fine, we, we subsist on that culture, a philanthropic culture, and the people who have, inst um, sorry, not institutionally, but um, like structurally contributed to that have had years, generations, frankly, of wealth, you know, uh, built up behind them and generations of, I guess, societal and class norms built into their understanding of how that whole structure works, how a board supports an organization and how therefore power flows from the board. Um, and that's not something that you can just put people on the board and expect to change. You know, that's a pretty long term, maybe generations long term um, cultural danger that I see. There was just this article that one of our listeners um, sent us about the Buffalo Philharmonic having a fellowship position that is intended only for people of color. And, you know, this was picked up by the National Review, which is like a very reactionary, conservative, you know, kind of quasi Fox News-ish uh, news source. And of course, you know, they're they're fighting back against it. But I'm I'm curious, you know, either on the either on the wavelength of female conductors or let's say let's say of American conductors, should there be, you know, restrictions in place? Like should orchestras commit themselves? Like Joe Biden committed himself to um, you know, he was only going to pick a, a female vice president candidate. You know, should there be an orchestra that steps up, you know, maybe one of these orchestras that's looking right now and says, you know what, we're only going to look at female candidates or we're only going to look at American candidates. I know that they're two very different things, and I think that they have different answers, but I'm, I'm curious what anybody here thinks about either of those um, ideas. I am totally in favor of those because actually at the beginning of my career, I was the product of those efforts. I, I went, for example, to the Dallas Opera Heart Institute for Women Conductors, uh, which was my first opportunity to uh, opera with major singers and an orchestra. Like I always did small things, but never something to show up. So the, conf the confidence gap, this is one thing. And the not only it's called the confidence gap in the Harvard Business Review, but the bias gap, the mm -hmm. experience gap. Mm -hmm. it's it's even worse with people of color so for me to show like uh, with these videos and they actually gave us extraordinary opportunities for us to have videos to have these uh, you know people going and seeing us I would have never gotten where I was I mean I was applying with everybody else with uh, almost double of the academic experience and never got in with mediocre people to get, you know, so, and, and I, I, I said like this very openly. So now that I have the experience, now that I can show the other things, now people see me with other lens. Even if we were to look at this from the more corporate or patriarchal society structure that we know, I actually think that there's a great argument for doing precisely what you said, Will, mm -hmm. um, which is, let's, let's say one of these top 25, uh, one of those openings, one of these big music director positions says, we are only going to look at women conductors this mm -hmm. uh, for the for this application cycle. I think there's a great argument for this, and that's that I would say we have reached critical mass in terms of density in the field for right. for for a for a hiring committee to avoid what is really the chief fear when um, when you talk about measures like this, which is you set up a search, you invest hundreds, thousands, whatever. Um, into into the whole process, you bring in all these people, and then you end up with somebody you don't like, mm -hmm. right? That's the fear, and you 
I guess, statistically increase that the possibility of this happening if you're going to limit your field by half. But like, give me a break. You can limit your field by half now and end up with any one of a number of dynamite mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Dynamite. Yeah. If you and and you will, in addition to that, be putting yourself at the absolute vanguard, you know, as far as as far as this movement is concerned, like you would gain so much from doing that mm -hmm. when when you end up with your not only like amazingly qualified dynamite American woman conductor, whatever, and and you get to all the associated, you know, watershed benefits from that um concrete and not i think there's actually a really good and like f even from a you know fairly cynical standpoint a good argument for this isn't there something to be said also though then about the music director searches and how kind of non-transparent all of that is the bigger the orchestra the non-transparent that is right like the smaller orchestras say like we're you know we're gonna have all the finalists for our music director positions this season so everybody's like it's like very much out in the open it's like one of these five people are going to be you know they're going to be the next music director right it's like a reality right. show but the, the the grander the stage the you know the more uh, opaque it is in terms of how it all works as well so that also is kind of a potential roadblock for all of that as well at the highest levels there is some level of opaqueness that just happens i mean you know we're not talking about music anymore we're just talking about the corporate world and you know the, the the top floor dealings that happen to take care of the most important mergers or whatever it is um but uh that i don't think would preclude a statement of this kind of the, you know the kind that will suggest which is we are only going to take you can have as opaque a process as you want <laughs> but with with that you know kind of in place i mean i'm not advocating for this obviously but like you could still end up with all the benefits and and still holding your fr frankly I think a number of orchestras that count themselves in the top 25 are still going to be afraid of the outcome of running a search and potentially ending up with either no candidate or a candidate that they don't like. I think a, a number of the top 25 are still going to be scared of this. So that's why one of the, the top five needs to do this, mm -hmm. <laughs> because then you're going to get the quality of applicants and be able to, 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 to parse them out because it is, it is a cutthroat process. I mean, let's not make any kind of bones about that it's gonna be it's gonna be tough and it's you know the last one standing is that's who will win the position it's not gonna be pretty i don't think <laughs> i don't think there's a way to prettify this competition although you know we'll that would be nice and let's but uh, let's 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 start with uh let's start somewhere but the point is one of the top five needs to do this i think well um hot topic a good topic and one that obviously we on the gab fest are very interested in but most of all, thanks to our uh, guest today, Lena, for joining the podcast. The last thing I'd like to ask you, Lena, is that before you go, would you be willing to recommend something for our classical mixtape? Absolutely. In our classical mixtape, we each recommend some music that's caught our ear this week to share with our listeners. So, Lena, what do you have this week? Well, not only this week, but all the time, I'm going <laughs> to he hear, like, do a shameless uh, promotion. So I have this orchestra uh, that is very apropos for uh, Latin and Hispanic uh, Heritage Month, uh, which focuses only on Latin American music. And um, to intersect with that, um, it's the 100th year of anniversary of Piazzolla. So... I am sharing with you this version of um, the Argentinian seasons, the Piazzolla seasons, but instead of being with a, just a single violin, which is the Russian version, actually I'm giving you a version that it's with quartet, and it's like the Latin American quartet, which is the, the quartet that has like the most recordings of Latin American music up to this moment and they have these amazing arrangements that they did with me with Unitas Ensemble. So you will hear Piazzolla did it all. He combined what is urban music uh, because Tanguitz urban, uh, the intersection of a dance meant to be danced only by men because it was very indecent and uh, was born in uh, the Burdells in in Argentina and then it became something so much bigger than that.
That is a fantastic suggestion. Lena, thank you so much for that. And thank you for being on the podcast today. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, Kencho, what do you have this week? All right. So in um, kind of accordance with all things Ravel after our um, movie club, I am suggesting a performance of Ravel's Sonata for Violin and Cello. It's like one of the pieces that's still on my list of things that I would like to play oh my God, um, it's so with amazing. the cellos. It's one of my favorite things. And I found this great recording by uh, Julia Kang, who is the first associate concert master of the Philadelphia Orchestra, playing uh, with her husband, Tom Cranes. And I thought that was also apropos of, of the movie itself as well. So I hope you enjoyed this performance. <laughs> Obviously, that's a, a very popular suggestion among our crowd here. Thanks for bringing that to the podcast, to the Mixtape Ken Show. Uh, Tiffany, what do you have this week? I don't have anything apropos of anything. This is just something that I was enjoying this week. Um, I was back in my beloved world of Brahms and missing, frankly, like the act of just simply performing music. Mm. And that was what that was why I landed in solo piano land, because that's even that's something that I miss playing the violin sometimes because it's hard, it's hard to create a world on the violin the way you can with the piano. Mm -hmm. um, so here is uh, an early work by Brahms, his Ballad Opus 10, number four, which I don't know, Ballads are interesting. They're, they're so, it's, it's much more extended than his intermezzi become. His intermezzi are kind of these lovely short pieces and the Ballad is like, it's a true journey and it has this unbelievably dark trio and this like really heartbreaking ending. Really, really loved discovering this piece this week. And this is an amazing performance by Grigory Sokolov. The other three ballads are also on YouTube, so you can listen to those too. Well, that that's a fascinating one, Tiffany. That's new to me, um, and I, I'm really looking forward to giving it a listen here. That's, that's very cool. For my selection this week, I have chosen a performance by a woman who I think should be at the top of anybody's list for a music director, guest conductor, or in fact, a guest artist as a soprano. This is Barbara Hannigan, and she does one of the most virtuosic things I have ever seen, which is she performs this piece called Mysteries of the Macabre. Now, this is a sort of excerpt or kind of a, almost a mini suite from Le Grand Macabre. And the thing is that she conducts and sings this piece simultaneously. She's done it many times. And she like she wears these incredible costumes. I mean, they're sort of connected to like the weird oddball world of this opera. But like she's done it in she's like in, a like, total uh, leather. Yeah, she well, that's, that's, style right, almost. right. She's done it as as like a um, a Catholic schoolgirl, and she's <laughs> also done it as like in a Moira Rose wig and wearing like total yeah leather dominatrix outfit. So anyway, uh, I love this piece. I love the opera in general. 
And um, yeah, I just think that people should really check this out because it is amazing. find the links to all these into our full classical mixtape playlist in the show notes. And with that, it's time to wrap up this episode of the Classical Gap Fest. I'm Kensho Watanabe, and on behalf of Tiffany Liu and William White, I'd like to thank you so much for listening and to encourage you to subscribe and rate us on your podcast app. We'd also love your help spreading the word about the show on social media, where you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can reach us at classicalgabfest at gmail.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Until next time, happy listening, and we'll be with you next week.